so we can knock off. As we look at our appendicular skeleton, this is going to be the skeleton that's associated with the appendages. So on this figure, we have the arms and the legs colored green. The part that's typically tricky for students is what about the bones of the pelvis? What about the bones of the shoulder? Are those axial or are they appendicular? Because they're categorized as part of the trunk. So to be clear, the pelvis is part of the appendicular skeleton and the clavicle and scapula are also part of the appendicular skeletons as well. Let's focus first on our pectoral girdle. The pectoral girdle corresponds to the pectoral region on our bodies, excuse me, the mammary region on the body. It's going to be where we have our shoulder. It's the bones of the shoulder. These two bones of the shoulder are the clavicle and the scapula. They allow for us to have the attachment of our humerus. And as we look at the clavicle, we have two parts of the clavicle. We have the sternoclavicular joint. And I'm willing to bet you can figure out where the sternoclavicular joint is, in between the sternum and the clavicle. It's an excellently named joint. We also have the acromioclavicular joint. That's going to be the interface between the clavicle and the acromion of the scapula. When we think of the shoulder joint proper, the technical name for a shoulder joint is the glenohumeral joint. And that's because it's the, in the association of the glenoid, uh, glenoid cavity and the humerus. And as we look at our shoulder or our glenohumeral joint, it has a very loose attachment. Uh, when we have a presentation on joints and movement, we'll talk about structure and function. But just to emphasize right now, the looser the attachment, the higher the range of motion or the more degrees of freedom we have. And we can move our arm in many different directions because of that loose attachment. It also means that it's really easy to dislocate our shoulders. So as we look at our clavicle or collarbone, the sternal end attaches to the sternum. The acromial end attaches to the acromion of the scapula. Our clavicle is frequently broken by individuals that are mountain biking and crash their mountain bikes as they fly over their handlebars. It's often a bone that's fractured. The clavicle is also frequently fractured by college students driving a moped too fast. As we look at the clavicle, if you fracture your clavicle, the best treatment, the best method of treatment right now is just to let it heal on its own. Will you wear a sling to hold your arm immobile? It's a very painful break and oftentimes it heals slowly, not because of a lack of blood supply to the bone, but because the individual will frequently refracture it as they wiggle their arm around in the sling. We also have the scapula, also known as the bone of the shoulder blade. The scapula, according to early, early anatomists, resembles a shovel, although if we have any anthropology majors in here, you would know that the scapula wasn't typically used as a shovel, but typically was used as a plow or a hoe by early humans. Within the scapula, we have the suprascapular notch, which is going to be visible on the next slide. But we do have on, visible on this slide the scapular spine. And that scapular spine is a large ridge that's posterior in the scapula that allows for the muscles of our upper back to have good attachment points. Our suprascapular notch is located right here with an anterior view of our scapula. And as we look at this anterior view of our scapula, the acromion is the large superior process that's lateral. This acromion is going to serve as an attachment point of the clavicle. We also are going to have the glenoid cavity. This glenoid cavity is where the head of the humerus sits to form our shoulder joint or the glenohumeral joint. And we also are going to have the coracoid process. And the coracoid process, if you look at the root word associated with coracoid, um, early anatomists thought that this process looked like a crow or a raven, and that's why they named it coracoid process. Um, although I'll admit, I don't really see the bird when I look at it, but apparently it's there. 
It's kind of like the hippocampus in the brain. I don't necessarily see the horse, but apparently it's there. As we look at the humerus, and we'll stop with the humerus when we get to the distal end of the humerus. As we look at the humerus, the proximal end of the humerus has some notable structures associated with it. We have the head of the humerus, which is located right here, and it's going to be covered in articular cartilage. And then we have anatomical versus surgical necks. So if you're studying your root words, you know that the neck of a bone connects directly to the head of that bone. And that's very clear on the femur. However, on the humerus, the neck of the humerus is not very well per developed. So our anatomical neck doesn't have a very clear delineation or differentiation on it. Individuals that are going to have their shoulders replaced or have an artificial joint put in the soldier, shoulder, will instead of having their humerus sliced at the anatomical neck, will have their humerus sliced at the sur surgical neck. And they'll have the head, the anatomical neck, and the greater and lesser tubercles completely replaced with an artificial joint. The greater and lesser tubercles are located here and here. And these are large attachment points for the deltoid. We also are going to have the intertubicular sulcus. This groove allows for the tendon of the bicep to move freely. And then finally, we also have a deltoid tuberosity. This is another large attachment point for the muscle of our shoulder or the deltoid. And then finally, with the distal end of our humerus, we have some key structures that we need you to know in lab. As we look at the distal end of our humerus, we're going to have, from the anterior view, the capitulum and the trochula. The capitulum and trochula are covered with articular cartilage, and they form the joint or the articulation point between the humerus and the radius and ulna. We also have the olecranon fossa. This olecranon fossa is a smooth indentation. The olecranon process of the ulna sits in, and this keeps us from hyperextending our elbows. And then finally, superior, excuse me, not superior, proximal to the capitulum and trochula, we have the lateral and medial epicondyles, which serve as attachment points for muscles of the lower arm, the antibrachium, and muscles of the upper arm, the brachial regions. And that's our stopping point today. Let's call it a day. <laughs>